Okay, wow. Thanks everybody for coming. Today we're talking about topology and retopology. Uh, unique to have a whole room to talk about this all at once, so that's why I love the Blender conference um, of an otherwise niche subject. Uh, but should be fun. So to introduce myself, uh, my name is Jonathan Lampel. I work for a company called Autotroph, which uh, has a few projects. One of them is CG Cookie, and I've been teaching there for uh, about eight years or so. And they also have uh, Orange Turbine, which is consulting and tools. And um, I help manage the Retopo Flow project, which is also all about uh, retopology. So that is why I'm talking about topology today, because I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about it. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have as well. So super quick backstory. Um, back in 2012, Jonathan Williamson released the Mastering Modeling Workshop on CG Cookie. Uh, raise your hand if you happen to remember that. That was quite a while ago, but still a good number of people. Um, that was a collection of a lot of information that was kind of either scattered around the internet uh, through various forums, um, or you had to just figure it out yourself or uh, word of mouth kind of find information about subdivision surface modeling, non-destructive modeling, alt quad topology, types of loops and poles, sculpting, retopology. It was a absolutely massive 19 hour uh, video um, set of lessons uh, that covered the entire modeling process. And there wasn't really anything like that on the internet um, at the time. And so that was around when I got into modeling um, and then Shortly after, he did the Mesh Modeling Fundamentals. Again, Jonathan Williamson, 1.5 hours, so just getting the very basics in there. Um, but then he kind of phased out of teaching, and I was starting to teach, and so uh, I didn't want all of that information to just disappear off the internet because, again, nobody else was really talking about topology all that much, um, even on, on YouTube and other sites. Uh, there was just less information about that particular topic because it was kind of technical. Um, so. Uh, I started teaching a little bit with the Mesh Modeling Boot Camp, and I kind of just took all of the things from the workshop that I thought were the most important things, crammed it into a course, um, didn't cover as much of the like sculpting and stuff, but still uh, covered all of the essential modeling tools, all of the core topology concepts, and then again did that with the Mesh Modeling Fundamentals in 2020. And again, a little bit of Blender um, Modeling theory was in the Blender Basics. That's completely free, by the way, on YouTube. Uh, if, you're, if you have somebody that wants to get into Blender, you could point them to the Blender Basics. It's four hours of free video, um, all about the different parts of Blender. Uh, and then also, another version of the Mesh Modeling Fundamentals just came out recently. That has a bit more modeling theory, intermediate tools, subdivision surface modeling, hard surface modeling. Uh, all this to say is that I've spent six years going over the basics of modeling. Um, which is kind of a long time, uh, but also through that time, I don't want to just like regurgitate the same stuff every time. Um, so in that time, some things have changed. Technology has changed. The way that I've approached modeling has changed a little bit. And so I thought it would be interesting to just kind of go over how I think about modeling differently now versus when I started, because now I've seen a lot more uh, people get stuck at certain points. I've um, Got stuck myself at certain points. And so just the way that I've understand, how I understand topology and modeling has shifted a bit. So that's what we're going to go over today. Um, and a lot of it will be somewhat basic, and I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with a lot of the concepts. But there's also a lot of tools and um, kind of techniques that I don't see very often um, that we'll talk about. So hopefully, everybody will come away with at least one thing, um, or at least a couple of things that uh, you can apply to your own workflow, that will help out. So let's get into it. The first thing that I tell people that are new to Blender, new to 3D modeling, is to notice topology, kind of know what it is, how meshes are structured, be aware that that's important, but also don't worry about it. Um, the first thing about topology is to, to know that it exists, but not think about it too much. And the reason for that is that for beginners, it's almost never the issue. Um, I see beginners often, you know, if they get into topology, they start thinking about it too much and it takes away from the time that they could be spending on other things that are more important. So for example, proportions and adding detail are much more important than topology right out of the gate. So for example, 
um, one of our exercises on CG Cookie is modeling a low poly room. And the, uh, the biggest issues that I see with beginner work is, you know, you'll have uh, a chair or um, a bed and they're not in proportion to each other, right? The, the chair is really wide, the bed's super skinny, and that's just uh, indicative of beginner work because as you're working in 3D, like it's a new paradigm, right? So you're developing your eye and that takes some time. Um, also adding enough detail because each step when you're starting out takes so long um, that it's, it's hard to make enough objects. So you can tell beginner work because it's, they had the proportions are wrong. There's not enough stuff, like the room is pretty empty, you know? Um, and all of that is much more important than like the nuances of topology. Like that doesn't matter at that point. So it's not something you need to worry about right away. So focus on those two things first. But at some point you start modeling and you hit some sort of wall of, you can make your shapes, you can make simple objects, but they're not turning out exactly how you want. Maybe you see things online that are a bit more complicated and you don't even know how to start approaching those types of objects um, or what you do make ends up being maybe a little lumpy or the details aren't as defined as you'd like. They're not as crisp. Um, and that's, when you start to notice that stuff in your own work, that's a good sign that maybe topology is something that you'd want to look at next. So that's when you start. Uh, the first thing there is just defining details with loops. That's pretty self-explanatory when it comes to maybe hard surface, simple objects. Um, for example, you know, the course, the edge of a table has to have an edge that runs along it. Very intuitive. But when it comes with, or when it comes to more organic shapes, uh, like a hand, where is the edge? Um, it's a lot less obvious with organic shapes where you need to place your loops. And so, um, one thing that's interesting about topology as you're defining your loops is you're also defining kind of what's important about the object. Um, if you're looking for an art in topology or an art in modeling, it's uh, similar to drawing, how you're simplifying an object and you're taking the essence of it and trying to communicate that with simple strokes, you're doing that with edges in your topology um, because there's kind of an infinite number of things in any object that you could choose to define and how you pick out what to define is, is an art form. Um, so we're defining our details with loops and then we're directing our loops with poles and poles are um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, they're vertices with three, five, or more sides. So on the, uh, my left, your left, um, is a three-sided pole. And I used to say that poles were where loops take a turn, um, but that's not super accurate because one member pointed out at, at some point that um, there's poles on a cube and those loops go around in circles so they don't really turn in a way. Um, but they are where they split off from each other. So you can notice at the bottom, they start off parallel. Once they hit the pole, they're no longer parallel. They cross each other and things like that. Um, so, but those, those poles are how you move your loops um, into you know, alignment with each other or split them off or make them go around your details. So they're very important to notice and we'll talk about them a little bit more later. Uh, but for now, here's an example of a car. This was actually, I grabbed this from the um, really old mastering modeling workshop because I thought it was a great example and just sort of outlined some of the key loops in different colors. So you can see how all the details are defined strictly by loops uh, with the red and the blue, the red being the most important, the blue being kind of the secondary, and then the green and white just filling in the space and kind of rounding out the silhouette. So each type of loop has a different purpose um, and hopefully we can also get into that. Uh, let me make sure I'm checking the time as I'm going. Okay. So as I said, uh, the art of topology is also sort of the art of defining what's important. And that's why um, there's not really any great automatic retopology stuff at the moment. Uh, there, are, there is for like static objects and things that don't need to move. Um, if you have a rock, it doesn't really matter where the edges are necessarily. Um, you can find that pretty easily computationally. But when it comes to characters, things that deform, uh, things that are not static, then it's, uh, it's a lot more difficult to define you know, the joints programmatically or things like that. Um, clothes, for example. Um, so there's, there's not really any good automatic solutions out there for, for characters um, or anything that's a little bit more complex than like rocks and um, boxes and all that. 
So after that, um, one thing to understand about modeling is that at its core, everything is triangles. So whether you have a grid of quads, whether you have an end gone, in Blender under the hood, it's all triangles. And the quads and end gons are just a convenience feature to make modeling easier for you as a user. Um, but before it goes to the renderer, which is either your screen or you know, cycles or EV, um, then everything gets triangulated. So it kind of looks like that. Um, and this is important to at least know about as you're modeling. Um, but triangles have some interesting properties as well. And they're, they can be really, really useful in some situations. So number one is that they're really efficient. You can almost always, um, this isn't like 100% the case, but like in 98% of cases, you can make the same shape with fewer triangles than you can with quads. Um, so they're extremely efficient, especially for low poly modeling. And that's obviously why you see a lot of games using them. But also triangles give control. Um, here I have an example of a broken quad and you can't really see it super well. Um, let's say I rotate around and you can see that it's non-planar, right? Um, and so it's a little bit undefined in a way. And if you use a triangle, because I, it, gets, it gets triangulated you know, regardless, um, you can see that there's the triangle split right here, but it's not really defined by you, it's defined by Blender. Um, but if you explicitly put an edge there, then you have more control over that shape. Um, so you can still get into kind of the weeds of, of how things are triangulated by either setting it explicitly, or uh, what's really helpful is, I forgot when this was added to Blender, but if you go into a face, you can select it, go to the face menu, face data, and flip quad tessellation. So that's really helpful for working with games and things like that uh, when you have lots of low poly because it changes the shading. Um, and so it allows you to explicitly set how it's triangulated, but it still allows you to work with quads. So that's pretty nice. But also explicitly setting it with a triangle uh, can also be helpful. Another thing about triangles and working with triangles is that um, Blender is triangulating it right before it goes to the renderer, but also different apps can triangulate things differently. So if you have a, a model of quads in Blender, let's say you have a character and you want to paint it in Substance Painter, then if you export it as, let's say an FBX that supports quads, uh, you import it into Substance Painter, you bake your normals, uh, you import it back into Blender, you might get some glitches. And the reason for that is because Blender has a certain way of triangulating that might be different than Substance Painter. And so a lot of people have, have run into this and so what you want to do is just use the triangulate modifier. Um, that way you can still work with quads in edit mode. Just make sure you don't um, view it in edit mode. And so you can just work with quads as normal. But then when you export it, just hit apply modifiers in the export. And that way, um, what you see in Substance Painter will be the exact same as what you see in Blender. Um, but again, triangles, making sure that those are explicitly set uh, when importing and exporting can save a lot of headaches. Um, let's see. But triangles are really hard to work with. Uh, the reason for quads is um, just because it's a, a convenience feature for working with loops, because we talked about how loops are the most important part of modeling to define your details. But if you have just a, a mesh of triangles, you can't really easily work with loops. It's possible, but it's a huge pain. Um, so quads are just a, a convenience feature. Uh, here's an example of animating or um, rigging with triangles. Super old examples, by the way, from Polycount, but still very useful. Um, you can see how with a triangle, it uh, doesn't deform the outside as much. Like it doesn't uh, compress the um, outside. Like it still retains that shape very well. Whereas when you have the classic three loops, it does kind of smush it a little bit. Um, both can be used and since these are, are very old examples, right? They're very low topology or very low poly count. Whereas now in games, you have a little bit more polygons to work with and you can do a lot more with um, parallel loops. So this isn't as necessary as it used to be, but if you're working in games and things like that for mobile, um, you might still wanna go very low poly. So still useful to know about. Um, 
But I wanted to bring that up because uh, a lot of people would say that triangles don't deform well, and that can't be true because everything's triangles under the hood anyway. Um, so of course they deform well, it's just you have to use them intentionally. Okay, so quads just make things easier. Quads are the standard uh, for a reason, because it's easy to work with, it's easy to pass to another person for them to understand the model. Um, and overall, it's the best default, because all things considered, um, if you have something that's you know evenly spaced quads, it's, no matter what you throw at it, it's just going to be able to support more types of deformations um, than if you have triangles and n-gons. So I still do support having quads as kind of the default, unless you have a reason to use triangles or n-gons. N-gons are very fluid and are super useful for certain situations. So here's a kind of an extreme example where we have a smooth shape at the bottom uh, of the mesh. And at the top, we have a very simple shape. And if I were to go into edit mode and try to move where that hole is, it would be super cumbersome. Uh, same thing with the top. If I wanted to just tilt it a little bit, that would be a huge pain. I mean, I could you know, use some tools to do that, uh, but it wouldn't be just like a one-click thing. Whereas if you use n-gons, of course, that simplifies it a lot. I can move or reshape that hole. Uh, I can add edge loops to any of these sides and just becomes very, very easy to work with. So again, n-gons are also just a convenience feature um, for working with certain types of objects. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. N-gons are also very good blockers. So when you're working on topology, let's say on the right side here, I have uh, some detail that I want to create, but I don't want to mess up this left side. But if you just make one big n-gon, then I can run as many loops as I need to or work on my topology over on this right side without messing up the left side. So you can imagine that uh, if you're working on you know, a hand, you're still working on your loops, you're not quite done with it yet, but you need to line it up with the rest of the arm, uh, you might want to put an n-gon temporarily on the wrist just so that you don't um, get loops that run up all the way through around the body. Uh, so they're really good for just temporarily blocking topology. But also, n-gons are very fragile. So if we were to deform an n-gon, you can see that the quad over here on the uh, left is very stable. But as we push it further and further, the n-gon starts freaking out. Of course, it doesn't look good even to begin with, but at a certain point, it starts recalculating itself um, and, and freaking out. So you definitely don't want to deform n-gons. They're not great on rounded surfaces. Um, so I generally only use them on flat surfaces for hard surface stuff um, for the most part. We'll talk about a cool exception in a minute, but they, uh, they also do like recalculate if you push them too far, which of course isn't like great for performance either. If you think about that, or like recalculating on any, every frame isn't the best. Uh, so again, if you are in doubt, quads are the way to go. But again, it's just a convenience feature for some types of modeling. <clears throat> okay. Subdiv. Um, I heard a lot when I was starting to model that subdivision surfaces, when you're working with them, uh, should be all quads. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard that. Or, okay, a lot of people that model. Um, the funny thing about that, and this is something that nobody told me uh, until, like, I think I just found out about it, like, maybe three or so years ago, is that subdivision surfaces are all quads anyway, uh, which in turn are triangles. So, for example, we have a couple uh, meshes down here. One of them has a triangle in the middle. One of them has an n-gon. The other one has a, a grid of triangles. <clears throat> and uh, when you subdivide a triangle or an n-gon, no matter what you throw at the subdivision surface modifier, it will always return quads because that's just a feature of splitting an edge in half all the way around. Um, so it just happens to be a convenient mathematical fact that the end result of a subdivision surface modifier is all quads anyway. So, oh, thank you so much, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, so why, why do we say that we want to model with all quads when working with subdivision surfaces when the result is quads anyway? Well, 
triangles and n-gons create poles. And poles, as we talked about before, is what drives or uh, allows us to create our details by moving our loops around. Um, and it's those poles which we want to watch out for, but which can also be helpful in certain situations. So notice with the triangle, we have one three-sided pole right in the middle. Um, and then with the n-gon, we have one um, n-sided pole, but it happens to be the same number of sides as sides of the n-gon. Uh, we have one big pole in the middle, but then also over here, we have three-sided poles kind of every other. So those poles create differences in the end result uh, vertex density. And the, those differences in density are what create the pinching. So it's not the n-gon, it's not the triangle itself, it's the difference in vertex density of the result of the subdivision surface modifier. So here you can see a subdivided n-gon um, at different levels of subdivision. And when it's really, really subdivided, then you can really easily see um, how those play out. So five or more sided poles will create areas of low vertex density and areas of three or three sided poles um, will uh, create areas of high vertex density. And it's those alternating differences in density that creates the pinching that creates the issue. Now, if it's on a flat surface, it doesn't matter. Um, but if it's on a rounded surface or a deforming area, that's where you run into trouble. So again, it's not the end gone itself, it's the difference in density that it creates. And when you think about that, then it allows you to do some cool stuff with end gons. So just to illustrate that, again, <clears throat> it's the same thing as sharpening up a subdivision surface. You know, if you add loops like this, right, you know that that middle loop is now a little bit sharper, but it's just because of that difference in vertex density. Um, and same thing with n-gons. So here's an example. Uh, I actually created this um, for a challenge on Twitter from Jordan Kane, who's kind of the internet n-gon guy. And he's been talking about n-gons for forever. And at some point, it kind of piqued my curiosity. I was like, huh, maybe I should start using n-gons in subdivision surface modeling. But it seemed kind of abstract, and it didn't really get um, what was going on or like when to use them. And it seemed kind of weird. But um, when I realized that first, the result of the subdivision surface is all quads anyway, and also that you can um, turn on the wireframe for your mesh, <clears throat> and then go to the opacity of that wireframe in the 3D viewport, turn that down a little bit. If it's at 100, it's very confusing. Turn that down. And then for the subdivision surface modifier, turn off optimal display, because then you'll only get the original edges. But if you turn that off, then you'll see all subdiv levels. And that way that you can actually see in real time what's happening. So if you just take some faces, turn it into an end gone, right? You can immediately see the resulting quads. Same thing with triangles. If I tri triangulate this area, you can see the effect that it has right away. So if you want to start using triangles and n-gons just work like this, and then you'll immediately see the resulting quads, and it's very easy to adapt. Um, so up here, I have <clears throat> one uh, n-gon that if we do not have a subdiv on, let's turn that off, control zero, uh, then it looks kind of ugly, right? And then we have that triangle there. Uh, it doesn't look super good, but when we add our subdiv, like so, I'll just add one level, we go in there, uh, then you can see how it redirects the edge loops. So we have one loop that comes down and it places a pole right in the middle. So this loop comes down and around. <coughs> Excuse me, man. And then uh, we have another loop that goes down and through the hole. Um, one loop that comes down and around and so we're just using that pole to redirect the loops. But the reason that this is very cool is because as an n-gon, it allows us to work more simply than if we were doing this with strictly all quads in edit mode. For example, if I wanted to get this same topology, I would have to have the density 
uh, essentially of an applied subdivision surface modifier. Like all of my quads would be, you know, this small. Um, and I'd be working with all of those quads in edit mode, and that's super cumbersome. Um, it's hard to make adjustments, and there's not really any reason to do that because the subdivision surface adds a lot of the smoothing. We don't want to work, you know, more at a level of more complexity than we need to. So working with n-gons allows us to direct our resulting loops without working with all that complexity. So it's kind of just like a, a little hack um, for directing the resulting loops. Um, same thing with triangles as well. So um, I found that extremely helpful, and hopefully you can also start working with n-gons. Okay, uh, loops give control over the result. Um, we talked about before a little bit about how they define the details, um, but then you also, with subdivision surfaces, need support loops, of course, to help um, retain that edge. Otherwise, it gets pulled up into any uh, poles that are next to it. So when you're working with subdiv, you always want that retaining edge. And there's a couple ways to do that. First is with holding edges, just like We've already done a lot, uh, just adding edge loops, right? Sharpening things up, just like so. Uh, pretty simple, pretty easy. Uh, also, they can be bevels. There's no reason that um, this can't be done non-destructively. So if I delete that edge loop, and let's look at a modifier. Let's say we have a bevel modifier. I'll place that above the subdiv. <clears throat> um, if you want to do this non-destructively, what you need to do is just for your bevel modifier, make sure the segments is set to an even number. That way you have one edge right in the middle. Otherwise, it'll kind of cut off that corner and you'll get a different shape. So set that to an even number. And then for the profile, just make sure the shape is set to one. So now this is exactly the same as adding an edge loop on either side. Now, what's really cool is that in 4.3, you can actually set this to, let's see. Ooh, okay. Maybe I need a different build. But in 4.3, you will be able to set this to a uh, edge attribute rather than just a vertex group. And this is super cool so that you can actually have different bevel modifiers with different edges that have different, differently um, uh, sharpened subdiv edges. So you might have one area that has four segments and being a little bit sharper. Uh, and you might have some that have two or that have different amounts or weights or anything like that, um, different profiles. And you can just work non-destructively all around the mesh, which you could not do before. So big thanks to whoever added the um, attributes to the bevel modifier, because that's really, really helpful for this type of workflow. So you can use bevels to sharpen subdivision surfaces. Uh, and you can also use creases. Actually, let's get rid of the bevel. And if we look at our subdiv again, we can also crease things. So if we go to our sidebar, let's take the crease, turn it all the way up. And this works for more low poly stuff. Because you can see, of course, we need to auto smooth this um, in order for it to look good, or at least um, set a sharp, like so. And it looks pretty decent. Um, but the problem with this is that it's pretty low quality uh, because this other edge is way over here. Um, and there's nothing that's really close to that. And also, you can't really get an in-between. Uh, for example, if I take this and I turn the crease down, it, uh, it gets like close until it gets to about 0.5. And then it kind of stops if you like zoom in. Um, and then it pops all the way to one at some point. So it kind of jumps, and it doesn't really give you very much control. And also, the, re the result of like a somewhat creased edge just looks really bad, because it doesn't have the rest of the geometry to smooth out the shading or to add more detail to that area. So by default, uh, it doesn't look great. Um, but for background objects, it works fine. One thing that you can do is uh, set it all the way to one and just use like the uh, bevel shader. So that's something that you can do uh, on like a background object. You can still use the nice rounding of the subdiv modifier, crease it to one, um, and then use the bevel shader. 
But also, you can use a technique called double smooth, which uh, was also on the polycount forum from forever ago. But I don't really see people using this all that much. So I thought it was, was pretty fun. Um, this was also in a thread by Ben Mathis, who made the hand earlier. If you f want to find his work, I kid you not, you have to go to poopinmymouth.com. Um, that's his portfolio site. Uh, and uh, lots of great tutorials, though. Um, but the, the trick with this is just um, two subdivision surfaces. So if we have only one, and we set it to a really low level, then you can see the result, like off and on. And some of these edges are creased. And like we talked about before, you can't have a somewhat creased edge, like that looks really bad. But what you can do is you can have one that's completely creased at a low subdivision surface level, add another subdivision surface modifier to it, and make sure that this one does not use creases. So this one does use creases, this one does not use creases, and this is where the second one is most of our smoothing is coming from. Um, so now, with this setup, I can control these creases, just like this, um, and get pretty con like good control over um, these shapes. So I can use a super simple object, in this case, just a square, um, and really finely tune how these edges are not only creased, but also uh, you know, how round some of these parts are. So I grab these. And you can get really pretty detailed uh, with a really simple mesh. And again, having a simple mesh in edit mode just makes everything easier. Uh, let me see time. Oh, we're good. Uh, junctions contain detail. I'm sure if you've been around modeling a while, you've probably seen uh, diagrams like this of all quad junctions. And the main use of them really is just to contain detail in some area. So for example, uh, at the bottom of this first one, we have three loops coming into the junction, and at the end we just have one coming out. So if you just think of, I have a lot of detail in one area, I need another area to be more simple, okay, I just need to use one of these junctions. Um, and they're pretty easy to make, you can make them with the knife tool, or there's different techniques, but for the most part you just use them to simplify areas. The first one is three to one, so if you have an odd number of loops, then you can use that. If you have an even number of loops, you can use the second one. Uh, and the third one is just four corners, but it's essentially the same as the second, but slightly different. Um, but it's just used for simplifying objects. An example of that is this dog here, where I have a lot of loops coming up and around the head. And this is another example of a exercise that's on CG Cookie for uh, beginners to practice. And one of the main problems that I often see is, since the face needs lots of detail, those loops will come from the face, up and around, and they'll end up all the way on the tail. And so the tail ends up being very sharp and boxy because the top and bottom will have all of these loops, the side will not have that many loops, and so that difference in density creates that pinching and the, the boxy shape. So what we wanna do instead is use those junctions to simplify as we go down the body. So for example, I have one here at the top, uh, just to simplify, reduce two loops as it goes down to the neck, and then over here, uh, towards the back, um, as it goes towards the hips, also just simplifying again. That way, by the time we get to the tail, we only have one edge loop here in the middle, um, and just one on either side. And it's you know evenly distributed and works quite well. So just think about how you can simplify your geometry as you're going into areas of uh, lower detail, um, and that way you keeps your mesh nice and smooth. You don't get those pinching uh, points, um, and keeps things a little bit nicer. And that way, when it gets subdivided more and more, everything is, is very evenly spaced and all of that. Um, let's see, we don't have too much time, so I'll skip over some of this a little bit. But when you're working with low poly objects, it's all about the silhouette. Um, it's not necessarily about the specific topology itself, because you're often baking normals. So you can kind of throw some topology rules out the window a little bit. But each edge has to have some sort of uh, role. So you don't have loops you know, straight down the middle of things that aren't supporting any shape. Um, but when you're working with low poly stuff, uh, every single edge either has to support the silhouette, uh, cast a shadow, um, divide like materials, or be used as like a UV seam. Um, and if it's not any of those things, then you can just get rid of it. Uh, so it's about simplifying things as much as possible 
and making sure that every edge has some sort of purpose. Of course, part of good topology is just avoiding bad topology. Um, and even if you just avoid bad topology, then you'll get most of the way there. So also helpful. And bad topology, I would say, is just broken faces, kind of like we looked at before. Things that are so non-planar that they you know, just kind of break, obviously. Though Blender's rendering has gotten a lot better in uh, how they display uh, non-planar quads. So for example, this actually looks fine from above. And in EV and cycles and the viewport, actually looks pretty good. Uh, but in other renderers, that's not always the case. So just be careful of that. Uh, also, concave quads can cause a ton of problems. So anything where you, know, you have one vertex that's kind of inside the others, and it makes this concave shape, um, just makes the loops so confusing that you will um, <laughs> get very frustrated. Uh, so just try to avoid those if possible, because it makes everything cross itself, and it looks very bad. Um, long, thin faces, not great for rendering, not great for um, just general topology. It just it, it breaks a lot of workflows. Um, this is the kind of stuff that if you've ever worked with text in Blender and you automatically convert it to a mesh, you'll get just all of these. Um, and you try to avoid those if at all possible. Overly dense geo, of course. Um, just something that I see a lot uh, with people who submit models for debugging retopo flow kind of stuff is... On one hand, Retopo Flow is great for quickly sketching out a lot of quad geometry. The downside is that it's really good at sketching out a lot of quad geometry. And so um, I get these files where, where people have way overly complicated the retopology um, just with so much geo that doesn't need to be there. So try to keep things, again, as simple as possible. If you're working with subdivision surfaces, really lean on the subdiv to do most of the work um, for the smoothing. Non-manifold geometry, inconsistent normals, um, and loose edges or verts. I'm sure you're all aware here that the first thing to do with re debugging any mesh, recalculate normals, remove doubles. That's uh, kind of step one. Um, but that trips a lot of people up as well. Overlapping components, faces on top of each other. Um, just try not to do that. Internally connected components. Again, that creates a lot of problems uh, with you know, vertices that are connected inside the mesh uh, kind of can be hard to spot because it's not obvious from the outside, but also causes tons of shading issues. And uh, this one's interesting, not watertight, because, of course, if you have something that's being 3D printed, you have to have it watertight. Um, but this was taught um, a lot way back when um, that every mesh, like for games and things, should be one complete watertight mesh. And if anybody has an explanation as to why, uh, I'm super curious to hear it because that's not really the case anymore and I don't think it has been for quite some time. You think of games um, where you would probably want to get rid of some faces to save on texture space um, if it's not going to be seen or you know hair cards, things like that, where of course we're not using watertight meshes for most things. So if anybody knows where that came from and the history behind that, I would be very curious. Um, but that is technically non-manifold geometry, but also I don't worry about it. Um, here's an interesting case of non-manifold geometry. If we look at the face orientation, we can see that this is very bad topology, um, where we have inconsistent normals. Uh, I've just kind of filled in the faces inside this plane. Uh, but what's cool is that this is the exact same mesh, but with the solidify modifier. And you can see that here, um, on and off. And it does a really good job of interpreting this. So um, technically, you know, bad topology stuff can be really useful still in the process of creating something. Because this is really easy to adjust, it's easy to create, it's super fast, and the result with the solidify modifier is perfectly fine. Uh, if we go to wireframe mode, we can see that the topology for this is perfect. Like there's nothing connected inside. Um, there's no like holes or weird alignment stuff. It's actually a perfect mesh. Um, so the lesson there is just that the solidify modifier in Blender is way overpowered. Um, and if you don't use it a lot, then you might want to try the complex mode. Uh, and it, it works with a lot of things. So it's not perfect on, on everything. Uh, sometimes it still has some issues. But you can still throw a lot at it um, and work very quickly. And it just figures it out. <laughs> 
Let's see, let's turn that off. Uh, problem solving. Okay. First, uh, if you have an issue with your topology, um, the first thing to do is just notice the flexible areas of the mesh. So for example, n-gons. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't necessarily matter how many vertices exactly you have around an n-gon. So that's an area where if you add you know, one more loop next to it, it's fine. Um, so you can kind of punt a problem over to an area that has an n-gon. You can easily solve it. Same thing with uh, mesh boundaries, of course. It just terminates in empty space. You can add loops all day. Uh, it's not going to mess up any other part of the mesh. Same thing with an axis of symmetry. If you're using mirroring, you can run loops into each other across the axis of symmetry, and it's not going to mess up the rest of the mesh. Um, so it's an easy way to add loops. Also, flat areas. Uh, if you have some place that just isn't cooperating, uh, and you're able to punt that area over to a flat spot where the topology doesn't matter as much or just some place that it's not being deformed or it's not as, as curved, um, then you have a lot more leeway in what looks okay as the end result. So if you can kind of just shift your problem over to a flat area, then you might just solve it like that. Same thing with non-deforming areas too. Uh, the first thing that I usually go for, if the number of loops just aren't uh, lining up correctly, is, and I, I don't like the result that I'm getting, is I'll just take the entire area and just make one big n-gon and kind of nuke the result that I had, uh, and then just solve it again with the knife tool. Um, and that way you can quickly iterate, and if the first thing you try doesn't work, you can try it again. Um, and the knife tool is super flexible. So again, the first thing that I do is either delete the area and just start fresh, or use an n-gon and knife. And uh, one thing that's helpful there is stashing. And I don't know if there's another term for it, but that's the uh, kind of term that mesh machine uses. And so I've kind of stolen that term. And that's where you take a part of the mesh and you duplicate it. And then you work on one area and you use that as part of the process. For example, um, if you think about the n-gon and knife method of fixing an area, that doesn't really work on a rounded surface. Because as soon as you make one n-gon, the rounded parts um, all get flattened out. And so you don't have access to that anymore. But if you duplicate the area and then make your end gone and start placing your points, then you can essentially use the duplicated part as a retopology base and then keep all of your curves. So you can imagine doing this on like a sphere. You can delete a whole part um, and still get the same shape that you had before, but with better topology. So you can use retopology tools for things other than just working on high density sculpts. Um, I use, of course, I'm a little bit biased, but I, I use retopology tools like RetopoFlow uh, for a lot more than just sculpts. Like I can boolean together things super quickly. I can just take um, primitives and smash them into each other, uh, remesh them with an automatic remesher at like a really high density. And so I can get a, a complicated, whether it's a hard surface or any other shape, pretty fast. And then I'll go through and fix the topology later with a retopology type workflow. So it's not just for uh, sculpting and things like that. It's also for just fixing areas in general. And again, just keep it as simple as possible. And lastly, delete it and start over is probably uh, the number one thing that will help if nothing else is working, because it's obviously very demotivating to uh, have to delete something after you've been working for hours on it. Uh, but also, when you create it again, you already know what worked, what didn't work, and you can usually make it in half the time or less, um, and the end result is way, way, way better. So some of the best models that I've worked on, I've deleted and start over, started over um, maybe three or four times, maybe five, maybe 10. Um, but every time it gets a bit better, and uh, that really helps the learning process. So especially as a beginner, um, if you're having trouble with topology, delete it. Maybe wait a day or two to like refresh so you're not like super frustrated. Uh, but just starting over a few times will drastically improve your results, more so than just working on um, getting stuck and then moving to a different object, getting stuck, moving to something else. If you just keep going on what the problem is, you'll definitely solve it um, this way. And lastly, uh, one thing that's helpful is manipulating normals. So here's a, a tricky area where I had a um, 
in the pothead course, uh, there is this pot up here, which is pretty simple all the way around. And I didn't want to overcomplicate the entire rest of the pot just to put in these details over here. And this is kind of a notoriously difficult problem of putting in holes, very specific holes, on a large rounded surface, especially when working with subdivision surfaces, because what you end up with is a lot of lumps. And let's see, I kind of showed you already how, how I went about that, is I just connected it with triangles, um, which originally is you know pretty not a good idea. Like it doesn't look very pretty. Uh, if I go over here, and I turn off the data transfer modifier, you can see that the result is very lumpy and looks pretty bad. Let's see if I can show it a bit better on the screen there. Uh, but hopefully you can see in this area all these little lumps. Um, so the way that I solved it is the, the one thing that you could do is make sure that there's even density all the way around, right? Because no matter what you do, if you have a small detail on a large surface, there's no way to combine the low density and high density areas without having some pinching. So I could have subdivided the entire pot several times such that the density matched those details and then connected everything with quads. That's one way to do it. Um, I didn't really want to do that, um, just to increase the complexity of everything else. So what I did was I just duplicated the pot and I have a, a version without any holes in it. And then I'm using the data transfer modifier to transfer those normals to everywhere except the holes. Uh, and so the end result looks flawless. Um, like it's about as good as it can get. Uh, and with subdivision surfaces, it's a little bit slow because you're working with a lot of geometry and it has to match the topology. And so uh, actually in the other version, let's see if I can find that. Period on the number pad and the outliner, by the way, fantastic. Um, you can see the other version is here. And I actually have drivers to uh, copy it over to this version. Uh, so it just copies the same subdiv level. So it is a little, maybe that's a little overcomplicated as well, uh, but I just didn't want to mess with all this other topology. Um, obviously, if you do this in animation, this is going to be a little bit slow because the uh, subdiv and then the data transfer isn't, um, it's going to be a little bit slow to calculate on every frame if the things are moving and deforming. Um, <clears throat> so what you can do though is if you, if you want to continue this along the pipeline, you could bake that down as a normal map um, and that'll just fix the shading issues. And this is what happens in games as well, where you can have a pretty rough topology, but as long as you bake the normals from something that is perfectly smooth, then you can just apply that to the other topology and it looks great. Um, so sometimes just kind of masking over the issue uh, rather than like spending days trying to get a perfect quad result um, can be so much faster because this took maybe a couple hours, two hours um, to model a good chunk of that um, rather than you know spending a day. So sometimes just the simple results will work. Uh, also that's dependent on the subdiv level. So again, it'll only work for one subdiv level at render time if you apply this, but uh, that's something that you can decide beforehand before applying it. So transferring normals, very helpful. Uh, and that's about it. So if you want to get into modeling or know somebody who wants to get into modeling, the mesh modeling fundamentals on CG Cookie, uh, you can watch that, Blender Basics, also Retopo Flow 4. A new version of Retopo Flow is coming out in the future. We are still working on that. Um, and I'm very excited because if you've used Retopo Flow in the past, uh, it's, it works very well for what it is, but it can be a little bit tricky to start up and, and get going. Um, so here I'm pretty excited about it because we can just add a new retopology. Uh, let's make sure we have an active object. And that'll just jump us into edit mode with one of these tools. And the Retopo Flow tools are just tools in edit mode. And you can draw out quads like so. Um, and at the moment, only Polypen is working in the alpha, um, but we'll get the other ones in hopefully shortly. And so using these retopology tools can also just help with normal topology as well.
So thank you so much. That's my talk. If you want to get this information, it's uh, almost everything in this is in a download just called The Art of Good Topology on cgcookie.com slash downloads. You can get that for free. Uh, if you have questions about the tools themselves or want custom modeling tools, ornishturbine.com. Thank you. Thank you.